Welcome to the Currently Cringing Podcast. I'm your host, Anisha Ramakrishna. I'm a TV personality and entrepreneur. Join me as I spill the chai on my cringeworthy life experiences with a side of dating, pop culture, and lots of laughs. Hey guys, welcome to Currently Cringing. Today, my guest is MJ, and I love how you say your name in your Persian accent, so I want you to say it. Mercedes. I love it. I've been watching you since I was in my late 20s and now I'm nearing 40. It's unreal that you're here. Thank you for having me. I love what your pod is about. I can talk about this stuff all day. Like it's just what makes me tick is just connecting with women. We just spoke a little bit before we hit record and I, I'm just really excited to be here and keep this conversation, the most important conversation going. Yeah. I'm so glad you're here because I think so many people, so many women look up to you because everything happened for you in society's terms later in life. Right. And you now have a family, you have this gorgeous baby Shams. Congratulations. Thanks. He's precious. And you have your home now in Calabasas, which I heard you put on your vision board. You know, you wanted to live there when you were done with Hollywood. And all of this happened for you. And I just want to dive in and just get get right into it. You know, you were born and raised in Virginia. I heard your parents were divorced and still lived together. Sort of. So my my parents divorced when I was six. And then when they, no, my mom moved all the way out. She moved all the way out, but nearby. And we stayed close to each other geographically. Um, I stayed uh, with my dad instead of going with mom, which is kind of like the, you know, the less common thing. And my mom went to like find herself. And after 10 years, nine years, when we moved to LA, my mom didn't come to LA until about like five or so years later. So we, my mom and I were like long distance uh, for a little while, but yeah, we're, you know, then we planted our flag out here. Um, And yeah, a lot of people don't know that I'm not really a born and raised Beverly Hills girl. Thank God. Thank God. (laughs) Well, were your parents strict? I mean, were you allowed to date or were you typical like Middle Eastern, like South Asian where, you know, you're in the lockdown? It's funny because they they conditioned me to be um, culturally um, compliant. So I didn't talk to my mom or dad about boys. I didn't acknowledge that. I didn't um, talk about dating or anything like that. I didn't, you know, just, I just had this respect for my father that, you know, I'm not going to be like my girlfriends. In fact, my girlfriends who were the opposite of me would be open with my dad and my mom and tell them everything. And like, some of my girlfriends were like, had pregnancy scares when I was like, I don't even know if I've kissed a guy yet. So, um, they weren't really outwardly strict, but they had worked on me for so many years that I knew like, um, you know, you just keep, it made me think really seriously about physically connecting with another person. And I did delay everything. And uh, my first love, like we we waited like months before we held hands. We waited like even longer before like our first kiss. And it was like, there was so much romantic, innocent love build up to it. So, um, you know, then like my parents like weren't that strict because they didn't have to control me. Cause I was such a, you're an obedient child. I was, and very, very, very shy. You would have never seen me at my, in my youth and thought this person is going to end up on a TV show reality being like all that kind of extra, you know? Yeah. How old were you when you had your first love? 
16, 17, 16. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Not 16, 17. It was, it was great. It was a Persian Jewish guy out here in um, Beverly Hills. So were you in that frame of mind? Like a lot of us are in these, you know, strong patriarchal cultures where, okay, I have to find a Persian guy. Yes, I was in the beginning. When I was 16, um, I thought that I was going to get married by the time I was like 22. And then, yeah, I think we all thought that. Right? Like you thought, like, but you thought like 18 was a million miles away. And then you thought 21. So every time I reached a milestone in my life, I was like, oh, hell no, I'm not ready. I still have to, you know, go to university and finish it. And I need some job experience and I need to travel. And I did all of those things. And I, you know, by that point, I knew that I wasn't going to be um, settling for anything. Um, I wasn't going to be, you know, it's funny that there was a guy that um, who's, I should I say his name? It's weird. Like, there's no reason really. Not. I doubt he's listening. <laughs> yeah. If he, so there's a, a an actor comedian who's Persian and we dated for 3.8 years meaning 3 years I think I know who you're talking about is his is his initials MJ yes because he does shows with one of my really good friends auntie zarna the indian auntie comedian there we go there we go and i've seen him isn't it crazy in life that's crazy. So we both watched all of our Persian Jewish friends get engaged, get married. And like, we were like sitting here dating going like, hell no. Like there's no way in hell we're going to lock down any of this stuff. We knew we were too young in our twenties to commit to like something like that. It's just, it's crazy. Right. So, um, when you get to a point where those people, their kids are in college now. And my kid is, you know, a toddler now. So um, I really think that when you delay, not that we intentionally delay, because we'll talk about like how you're now engaged and are you engaged yet? You're engaged now, right? I am. Yeah. Congratulations. Seriously. Um, when you delay or when it doesn't happen for you, the benefit is that once you have kids, and a husband, you have to, in my opinion, prioritize those two people, the, you know, the family and the husband. Uh, in, in a large way, you have to make such compromises that are inherent. Being a mother is not a part time or a side gig. You know, it's not a season. You know, it's a lifetime. And, you know, being a good wife is also going to be a big compromise. There are a lot of things you cannot do. I don't care who you are, what you are, what kind of like, you know, wokeness you want to say you can have it all. No, there's a lot. Of, once I caught, like met Tommy, I had to delete half of my phone and delete, you know, you, there's a, just the things that you do out of respect. You, you get, um, yep. you get booed up in, in a respectful way. And there's just things that you're just not going to do. Right. So, um, you know, I'm not going to be the youngest grandmother in the world, just like I'm not the youngest mom in the world. And that sucks. But at the same time, that's, I mean, if this works out, this whole new generation where right now, like moms becoming new moms in their forties is something that's new, right? There are not that many previous generations previous to us that can look back and say, like, yeah. I literally look at Gloria Vanderbilt, God rest her soul. And I say, hmm. You know, Anderson Cooper had his mom. She said, I believe that she had her son via IVF in these like early days. And now, you know, he's, you know, in his 50s, early 50s. And like, other than that, like, we don't yeah. know what's going to happen. I'm going to be 80 years old when I hopefully, when I, have, I haven't done the math properly and I should because I'm a realtor, but like, I want Shams to have start his family sooner. I hope he doesn't wait until he's in his forties. Cause then I'll be probably, I mean, yeah, I'll be, I don't know, 80, 90. I don't know. Let's not do the math. Let's not even do the math. <laughs> I get it. I mean, I'm going to be a mom in my forties. So I think, you know, it is becoming more and more common. 
when you delay having children, I feel like it's getting the best of both worlds. We are having kids later, but we are all in with our children. We are present and same with like with your with your significant other. I'm sure there's a lower divorce rate for people who get married later in life. There is. Right. OK, tell me. It's a fact. It's a statistic. People who get married past the age of 37 end up staying together. There you go. It's a real thing. But I, I agree with you. And even me now just moving to Arizona, you know, for love and being with my fiance now. It's exactly true what you said. So many things have to change. You know, I'm not, you know, I can't just spew garbage anymore like I used to, you know. Now I have to keep in mind that, oh, I'm also representing someone else. <laughs> yeah. When you decide to start your family and get married in your 20s, I feel like you were really cutting yourself off. I feel like you're like putting your 20s and most of your 30s away. Like you're kind of like dumping them into like this, like, no, like this non-existent place. Like you just almost don't, don't get to live what you should. I agree. Mm -hmm. For me, like I never really was interested in marriage. And it only happened to me when I turned 36 that I thought, you know what, I would like to get married and have a life companion. Were you ever in that situation where you didn't really care to get married or were you just not finding the right person and you wanted to get married? Yes, I wanted to get married sooner, but not that soon. So in my 20s, I knew it wasn't right for me. And I knew what was right for me was career, education, travel, and being a social butterfly, being an amazing mother, for, I mean, excuse me, daughter, friend. And that was it for me. Like there was no way. When I got over 35, then I wanted to, to happen, but only if it was love and it was for the right reasons. So when, you know, I definitely had my heart broken by some a-holes that were, you know, talk about dodging a bullet. Yes. Things that would have been really devastating. And definitely I would have ended up divorced if I got married to those people. One of my experiences. I knew that I wasn't in love, so I had to cut it off with a guy that would have been great, you know, on, he would have been a great husband, a great father, and, you know, financially, all of the things that would have worked out on paper, but like, I was not seeing myself attracted to him in that long-term sense. It was like this really weird, like, just to be like really specific and really intimate about this, like, there was like this thing where I was like, I don't think I can see that dick for the rest of my life. Like that just doesn't seem like the right thing for me. It was, was hard. I didn't want to turn him down because I loved him. I get it. But I knew that I wasn't giving him like the, you know, the cartoon heartbeat when like Bugs Bunny would like see someone and like, it was like boom, boom, boom. Yes. so that that was hard for me, but I knew it had to be done. And then the next guy was like the a-hole where I was like, who are you? Like, you're a fraud. You're not who I thought you were. And this was a guy that I met right before Shaz and Sons had started. So I thought I was like on my way to be like this, like wife of this, like really prestigious Middle Eastern guy. But, but to answer your question, none of that was going to happen until I was in my mid late thirties. And, um, and yeah, it like to speak to what you're doing, like you're saying, like, you're going to do it for the right reasons. And you were never really like Monica Geller trying to open up that wedding book scrapbook that you've created. No, <laughs> I just had like my mom yelling every day, like, when are you going to get married? I just had everyone in my life from friends to everybody just every day telling me I needed to get married. And then I only did it when I thought, Okay, I'd like to try marriage. Yeah, well, what about your eggs? Did you freeze your eggs? I froze my eggs. Okay. Uh, I wish I froze them earlier. I froze them at 36. I wish I knew, right? We don't know. No one tells us these things. No. I uh, wish I knew at 33. But at 33, you don't think you're going to be single at 37 or 38. No, you don't. So. 
So when you say you wish, is it because you wanted to bank some more than you got? Or you're just talking about like you're the egg quality, the guy, the doctor was telling you was both. Yeah. In reality, both reasons. Yeah. Well, listen, um, what you should do now that you're engaged is make embryos. Yeah. I mean, I got the lecture from my fertility doctor, Gadir, and when he, I was never more offended by a suggestion than when we were engaged and I was, I had just gotten proposed to, and he said to me, you should make some goddamn embryos. And I was like, what? I don't even know this guy. He's like, what is that rock on your finger? Like, I don't know. I don't know. It's just too fast. And it's like, what are you talking about? Like, so that, of course, I didn't take his advice. I want to, I have to get that done, but I'm going to circle back to now you've had these like asshole men and then you join Shaw's. Yeah. Okay. So for me, being on Family Karma, no one wanted to date me after. I completely see why, because I'm in the same culture where my friend Sammy from season one was like, he, he was like, girl, you're like, basically you're like public you know, damaged goods. You're on a reality show. You're in a bathing suit. Yeah. Your gay best friend was like waterfalling a champagne bottle on a beach in Mexico. You're not wifey material. Were you crazy? <laughs> yeah. And no one wanted to date me. Like I thought, okay, I'm on TV. I did this show. And then it was slim pickings. Like the people who <laughs> wanted to date me were like grosso, like gremlin goblins that wanted to be on, on the show. Isn't it so funny that the guys that have the balls to come up to you are like the most, like the most repulsive. And you're like, why would you approach yeah. me? Look at you. Like you, how do you have the balls to approach me? And then like the ones that actually like you from afar don't have the balls because they have too much pride to, yeah. you know, yeah, it happens. So yeah. then we're going to skip all the years of Shaw's because we watched it all, but you meet Tommy. On Tinder. Yeah. And did you expect to meet someone American at that point already? You know, the white boys I dated in my life were just like these guys at a bar that were usually like those, you know, like when you meet like a smart intellectual, like it was like, it would be like meeting Jason Bateman. Okay. You know, that type of guy where yeah. you're like, you're smart, you're funny, you're cool, you're like super tall, those green eyes, like that kind of thing, like, or a surfer guy, like those are the kind of white boys that I met that I was like, I could never marry you. Yeah. I'm never going to bring you to my house on Thanksgiving. And they're, they're prettier than us. So can't like, I don't want to be around you where you're like, you have better hair than me. Yeah. Like I can admire your freckles in the morning light, but that's about it. You know, um, so yeah, I never really saw them as like realistic partners for me, and I never saw them me I never saw myself introducing them to my family so no i I understand that's every <laughs> South Asian middle Eastern person I know it's like the non you know cultural person they're dating will yeah. never see their family mm -hmm. never. yeah. They might not even know they ever dated them. Yes, exactly. We're just like, nah. So you meet Tommy. Yeah. Oh, God. How did you know he was the one? You know, I really, when I first met him, I thought he was so crazy because he would, we had phone conversations before we met in person and he was so intense and he was like, you know, with his like accent and like blah, 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 blah. And, like we'd have like these really good conversations. But I would be like, bro, have you drank like too many cups of coffee? Like what's going on with you? You sound really hyped up. And he's like, what? What do you mean? This is how I talk. Da, da, da. So like it took a while because I liked everything about him, but I was so suspicious and I was so hard to come around. And, you know, I get it. Everyone has their process, but like I really put him through a lot before I trusted him, which had a lot to do with my trust issues. And 
also being someone that had been in a lot of long-term relationships, like I was with a guy for three years and I broke up and I was another three years. And then I was like serial monogamous. And all of a sudden I'm like, well, you need to be with somebody for a really long time before you can determine if this is the right person, because look at your past. You keep on breaking up with guys after multiple years with them. So you're not to be trusted. I would say to myself. So, um, my, the way that I finally figured it out was because of the, um, there was this like East coast, um, this loyalty, this ride or die aspect of him. When it came to, we have to go to the hospital every single day. We have to wait. Like it was like, it was a very sexy, passionate relationship where all we did was like bang, have shots, go to the movies, do all these beautiful, fun things. And then, and then when it was time, like something was seriously happening, then I was like, oh, this is not just a guy you met on Tinder. This is like a life partner. Um, so I just want to tell the story in a way, like I'm, I'm thinking, how does a, how does a girl or a woman today who's met the right guy and she's going through the same thing? Like, how do you figure it out? You know, like, so that like cut to you, how long have you guys been together? A year and a half. Okay. He proposed to you when? Oh, in a year and three months. And we did everything super fast. So we actually lived together within like six months, seven months of dating each other. And how did you know he was the one? Because we were compatible. But I think you have many ones, right? You have to pick which one you're going to make the one. Like, I think we have many soulmates and you can keep meeting people and keep meeting maybe the one. But this is the one I'm going to choose to marry. Okay, that's great. I mean, I think that you can. So like yesterday, one of my friends, excuse me, after 14 years, filed for divorce. All of a sudden, this person realized like, wow, I was so I, I, I've like liberated back to this person that I was. And I was like, wow, it's really crazy. But you can lose you can like lose yourself with the right person. You can lose yourself with the wrong person. You can lose yourself just into another person. So you're saying, um, we're not just meant for one person. If we, if I break up, if we get a divorce, then you might have like a second life remarrying. I think so. And it's what are you deciding to stick with? Okay. And I, I've decided this is the person I want to do anything to be with till the end. And where is he from? We're both Indian. Good. That's great. Yeah. Uh, But for me, family is like really important and it wouldn't have been an easy life, to be honest. Yeah, it wouldn't have been. So I've always been practical. You know what? I, I think that when you're in a mixed culture, um, you know, whatever God gives us. Right. Um, what's funny is that when I'm like at a family gathering, Tommy and any other time that, you know, my cousins marry someone that's not in, you know, Iranian, it's like, they're like, ah, they're probably talking about me. And I'm like, (laughs) like, come on. You know, like, or you have like the relatives that only speak Farsi to him, even though he can't understand a single word of it. You know, it's really, really cute. But, you know. Well, well, then you meet him, you get married. And then when did you decide, okay, we're going to have a baby? Well, he knew that I was going to freeze my eggs while we were in the very beginning of our relationship. And my fertility doctor good dear, talk to me, talked me into it. Finally. Um, I followed suit with what Selma Hayek was doing. She was on Oprah and she said, I'm 43 and I just gave birth to Valentina or something. And so I automatically assumed that was a marker for when I could have a baby. And, um, I didn't feel like that was the best thing to hear 
um, because even though it gave me false hope, um, it just, there was a lot of like delayed maturity. Like maybe if I wanted to like be really like, oh, everything's great. All my choices were perfect. No, I feel like I, for anyone who's going through this, I, I appreciate the luck that I also had in being able to successfully freeze my eggs, successfully make, make embryos, get pregnant, have a baby, like all of those things, like it's hard. I still watch my girlfriends that don't succeed in doing that because they do, we do have a biological clock. It sucks. And I hated anyone telling me anything about it. Um, but you know, some of my girlfriends have men who are not supportive of freezing eggs or making embryos. And wow. then they kind of lean towards the let's not do it because no one is, you know, you've got to be really gung ho about it. And I was really determined. And I was like, oh yeah, I'm freezing my eggs. And he was like, does this mean that you don't see yourself with me? That you're freezing your eggs? because you're planning for someone else. And I said, I'm freezing my eggs because it's time and I'm past due. And he was like, I'm just going to support you through this because I, and I was like, these eggs could be for you. They could be for me. They could be for whatever they are. But that's like, it was like a very, very, the space that I was finally in, albeit late, I was very, very clear and determined on like, this is what it's time to do. Um, I would just like you were saying 33 rather than 36. Yes. Anyone who is listening to this, there's no reason to delay freezing your eggs. It doesn't even cost as much as it used to. It used to be a fortune. And now it's like, you can subsidize it. If you have the right employer, you can finance it. You spend more money on, you know, iced coffee than you do. I say that. I say instead of buying like your next bag or your next vacation, freeze your eggs and don't freeze your eggs just because it's time. Freeze your eggs because you're young and your eggs are fabulous. Exactly. They don't get better. It's not like a, a Chanel bag that's going to go up in value or a Rolex or anything, you know, it's just, you know, our grandmothers determined how many eggs we were going to have before we were even born. So that's it. So then what a lot of people may or may not know is you actually struggled a lot. You almost died, but you had miscarriages and then you had a very difficult pregnancy and you almost died. And I heard your podcast yeah. till the dirt with Tommy and the doctor pretty much said you should have been dead. Like it's yes. a miracle you're here. But you know, it's so wild that I didn't get to experience the trauma that my husband went through because I can tell you like I was so you couldn't you couldn't talk me out of that I was going to have a baby you know I was so 100% sure that everything's going to be fine but the process was really bumpy the road during my pregnancy all of the things that the doctor would say, like, oh, you know, you, you just had like a blood clot that was really, that looked like it could have been the same as an MC. Um, then this went wrong. And not, but there was, I, I was in, I was, in, I was in labor for two days, but we couldn't, they had to induce me because of like some, and my, the last thing that went wrong in my pregnancy. And, um, I was laying back once they decided like, you're not dilating, you're not crowning, you're not, nothing is happening that it's supposed to, that's right. And all these bad things happened during um, labor. They rushed me to the OR for the emergency C-section and you're, you know, flat as can be on this, you know, obviously the OR is like a sterile stainless table. And I was really at the mercy of the, anesthesiologist I was looking up at him and he was like the person that I was connecting with 
And I, and I knew the doctors, there was like probably like 12 medical professionals from multiple doctors and nurses in the room and God, what a better place than Cedar sinai There really is no better place to have a medical emergency. They took such good care of me. They, no exaggeration, I did need about like 14 blood transfusions and platelets and all this weird, crazy stuff. But it's like telling the story, I didn't really experience it because I saw this man's face, the anesthesiologist, and he he was like, I'm going to put you out. This is like, not good. This is not, you shouldn't be awake anymore because I had already had the baby. They put the baby on you for a second and then they go and like clean him up and everything. I heard my doctor who, um, Dr. Oof, Jay Goldberg, he just passed away suddenly, um, mountain biking. He just, unfortunately he had, um, cardiac arrest, but he, Dr. Dr. Goldberg, who gave birth to thousands of babies, said to me, like, I see the, um, the, what is it that's wrapped around the placenta? You said the same thing on your podcast. I did. I couldn't remember. What is it? Is it placenta? placenta? Tommy said placenta. So, So, yeah. So thank you. That's so funny. So when that happened, when, when the doctor told me that like shit's going left and that he's gonna, he, like, I saw the struggle before I had a chance to panic. They put me under, I woke up, I lived, but the way the doctors and Cedar Sinai and the nurses and everyone who came in to check on me, once I got out of ICU, Wow, that really gave me a big clue as to what I had gone through was mage because they see it all. And if they're coming to check on me, then something must have gone down because they really did look like, I'm so glad you're alive. Like, I'm, you know, you really gave us the scare and all this stuff. And I was just like, I could, I was such a child about it. I was like, really? That sounds so cool. Like, but it wasn't. It was like, no, we saved your life, bitch. So many people die. because of the same thing, you know? Yeah. And, and I guess, what do you say to the people listening who are trying, you know, and it's not happening, you know, what got you through those days? Okay. So for the people who are trying to get pregnant, freeze their eggs. Um, so I would say consult my doctor. People get go go through, um, get on airplanes and get their passports out to make sure you're getting the best of the best, um, prioritize it. Don't worry about the money and, you know, go as far as you can. And if you're really in a position where it's, you know, like it's time to talk about an egg donor or a surrogate, then get an egg donor or a surrogate and don't rule out that it's also the man's, um, sperm because infertility impacts men as often as it impacts women. Yeah. So I just don't like the girlfriends of mine that ended up waiting until it was too late. And then they stayed with the guy until they're, you know, too old for freezing their eggs or caring or any of that stuff. And they almost get brainwashed in the wrong relationship with the wrong guy because the the woman wants it this much and the guy doesn't want it this much. And then he ends up, you know, overpowering her needs. And she's just like, well, maybe someday. Cause she was someone that heard the same interview on Oprah Winfrey that I heard, you know, people that have, Oh my gosh. Speaking of late births, what is the name? Bridget Nielsen. Didn't she have a healthy baby at the age of 58? Yeah, Janet Jackson, but that's not the norm. It's, and that's the thing. We shouldn't listen to these anomalies and that we have all the time in the world. High powered people with tons and tons of resources and money. You know, not everyone has that. It's like, freeze your eggs and don't listen to men. (laughs) Absolutely. Absolutely. Don't listen to, because men don't have that time frame. Yeah. And, and maybe that guy doesn't even want kids or who cares? He doesn't even know what he wants. Um, but, you know, with Tommy, he was like, I, 
you know, I kid and I say he was like an orphan because he lost his mom at such a young age. And then his dad, his mom and dad divorced. So he came from a very broken home and he never thought that he was ever going to be married or a father or any of those things. But the, the unwavering support that he gave me was like part of like what blew me away about him. And it really, he really taught me what love is, what it looks like, what loyalty looks like, you know, the kind of things that I didn't expect from any person unless he was going to be husband material, you know, the kind of loyalty that I got from him. I only expected from like my mom or my dad or like a close family member. Yeah. And you actually uh, removed your uterus. That's what they did when they put me, when they put me under, they were like the Dr. Steve Rad, an incredible doctor. Oh, you guys, the best of the best. He was like, Maris. He's, he's like, it, it, during, during this emergency, he's like, it's either you or your uterus. He was like, I'm really sorry. Cause like, they're, they're like kind of needed our permission to take it. And I was like, what am I going to do? Like, I can't say no, yeah. I can't say save my uterus so that I, you could bury my body, you know, but yes, yeah. I was very unaffected when I woke up. I just didn't, I never felt really heartbroken because I was like, you know, I believe in God and I believe in a, having a profound appreciation for the blessings that you do have. And my glass is always going to be half full, not half empty. So I never really had like this, like mourning for the loss of my uterus, the womb that creates you know, life, it was just more like, well, hopefully my son will create a bigger family than I did. You know, hopefully I can instill that. You could use a, a surrogate. I mean, is that an option? Do you want more children? <laughs> so you're asking me this question on the best possible day. I don't know if I can handle it. So yes, I can pursue surrogacy. And I hope that, you know, it happens for us. But girl kids are not easy we oh i believe you i mean i can barely take care of myself right but like you know we we don't have a nanny or you don't we don't wow so i just i just want to make sure we do it right with this kid a lot of i mean i think having multiple ch children is the way to go you know but I don't know, like, I'm, you know, we're running so many different things in our lives, you know, like, I'm still a woman, I work, I have multiple careers, I have dreams, endeavors, you know, like, I just don't know if I'm capable of it. And I think that it takes a lot of, um, I think it, it takes like a lot of courage to be able to say, like, I'm not sure if I can handle it. Which brings me to my next question, because I heard you say this on your podcast, Till the Dirt, that you were so used to just being you and Tommy and you spent a lot of time together and then now you have a baby. Mm -hmm. So how do you balance mm -hmm. that time? Because men do get jealous, even if it's their own child, you know, men want that attention. So what changed and any tips on how to continue to make it work post children. Okay. Yes. This is so important because you don't want to lose that relationship. You don't want to lose the passion. You don't want to lose that cute pillow talk, you know, that childlike in love, you know, cloud nine vibe that you have. And, and yet no disrespect on Tommy, that's for sure. But I think you're onto something when you say that the, the men get jealous, you know, they see the mom doting over the baby, prioritizing and like all of that bubbly pillow talk is on my son's pillow. Right. And it's yeah. the baby talk is like, 
no longer to my boyfriend or husband. It's like the actual baby that I, you know, like I know that he is the light of both of our lives, but I think that you have to, you can easily acknowledge that your parents are, we're so exhausted when we're new parents and you know, like you have to worry about SIDS. You have to worry about them suffocating, God forbid. You have to worry about their safety. There are, there's always going to be a, a new limit and a new height and a new, you know, something that you have to worry about them. But once you get to like the two year mark, there's like a, there's like a time where you're like sleeping. Now you're like sleeping a little bit better and you're going to start prioritizing yourself instead of, you know, breastfeeding and all of that stuff is behind you. And that's an important time for me. And I'm in it now where when I get into bed with Tommy, I cuddle up to him. I rub his chest. I'm like, hold his hand, like all of the intimacy you know, like he has a rule like that. We can't leave the house without kissing each other goodbye. And I'm, it wasn't my rule. So I would always like leave and he would call me and be like, you didn't, you didn't kiss me goodbye. And I would be like, God, you're so corny. Okay. fine. You're savage. (laughs) Like that would make me cry if someone forgot. (laughs) I was like mad at my fiance the other day because he's really busy and he's like, okay, I'll set alarms to text you. And I was like, are you fucking kidding me? Like, you need an alarm to say good night. Oh so yeah, a little bit. He just wanted a goodbye kiss. <laughs> You're like, bye. Oh my god, it's great. Yeah, so like, here's this like really romantic kid I found. You know, like in the depths of like this cesspool that is Tinder. You know, and at the end of it, at the end of the day they're like the boy that wants love, you know, and the man always wants to feel like a king. And if you're a smart woman, you're going to find a way to elevate that man and make him feel like he is sitting on a pedestal and you do it in very sincere, but brief ways. Like you want to know how to get to Tommy's heart, bring him a yoo from the liquor store on your way home, the gas station, you know, like bring him, ask him if he wants like, bring him his favorite sandwich, Um, you know, change the pillowcase, like just the smallest things, like bring him a water, bring him a smoothie, just very like anything that's nurturing and thoughtful is the way to his heart. And he loves his love language is touch. So those are things that I never, ever did. They never came easy to me. I never had to do it. I just never did. My dad nurtured me. My mom didn't nurture me, but I received it in a selfish way. And then like in the very beginning of our relationship, I would wait on him because I was in this like Pitocin. Is that, isn't that the oxytocin? What's the hormone that when we have an orgasm in the beginning, oxytocin, it is this oxytocin. It's oxytocin. You can, you can put like everything you have on it that it's oxytocin. Okay. So I used to treat him like intensely better. So now I'm like humbling myself and making myself uncomfortable to boo myself back up with him to him. And like, it's not like the door is closed, but it's kind of like, uh, the lock is a little sticky. You don't feel yourself for a very long time. You know, a lot of people feel this because of COVID, like, God, you know, I don't go out and, you know, we've been wearing elastic sweatpants and what does the suit feel like? And what do my heels into an office feel like? And it's like, yeah, all of those things. Plus, you know, you don't check yourself. You're not, you're, you're, when you're a good parent, you're probably neglecting yourself in the beginning. Right. So you're also neglecting your spouse and that's not cute. Like that's something you have to claw your way back into it. So when I get back into bed nowadays, I'm like, honey, I know you want to watch housewives or some shit. I know you want to scroll down your fucking, you know, 
yeah. your troll scroll, who cares? Like, is that really going to get you to what you need? Like, is that like, you're looking over at your husband on the other side of the bed and going like, just do it. Just go over there. Just go over there. Go one more. Cause like you, I, I actually trained my body to fall asleep as soon as I hit the mattress and I stare, I sleep on this one side and it's not the side that he's looking at. So it's like, <laughs> you know what I mean? So I'm like, always like, and I fall asleep right away. But now, no, it's so important to like break through your comfort zone and humble yourself back into, you know, and I also have considered um, like maybe if Shams is gone one night, I'm considering like maybe we can like, for me, I don't smoke marijuana that often, but when I do, I feel like I can like turn on candles and like put like a, a, a record on and like, it's like, you know, drum and bass or like, you know, one of those sexy vibes. Like I need to, you need yeah. to do that. Like that hotel getaway where you like kind of feel um, uninhibited, you know, whether it's, because for me, it's not really going to be alcohol yeah, because I drink all the time, but like, yeah, you know, people could like micro dose Molly or something. Yeah. Just something different, just something different to hang loose and maybe not be worried about your child 24 yeah. seven or for 24 hours. Right. <laughs> and I bet it would be cool to go to like someplace like Scottsdale or one of the yeah. beautiful vortexes in Sedona and, you know, do something cool. Yeah. You know, it's funny because our friend Lauren that you and I have in common says that you do circle around to your husband when the kids get to like a safe out of danger, you know, late toddler, early toddler, whatever phase. Yeah. My parents, you know, they're in their mid late sixties. They have each other now we're all gone. And, you know, you're with each other. Like at the end, you're ride or dies Tommy Shams is gonna go away and find a lot of things to do <laughs> yes and I'm I feel like I might have to start preparing myself early for that because it's going to take me a long time to uh to do that I in the meantime like I want my house to be the hub for all the kids and then I'm like well look if I get through like these crazy years right now Maybe we'll like instantly adopt somebody. Maybe we don't have to go through surrogacy. Maybe we will. Maybe, it, you know, it's like a lot of, um, a lot of things, but thank God, you know, like, thank God for everything that we have right now. And that's like what I, again, I don't, I don't spend my time thinking like, oh, Shams needs a sibling. Oh my God. I'm going to have a child in it. No, I'm, I'm good. No. I'm not. That would be so such a negative waste of energy for me. You know, just focus on not screwing this guy up, give him everything. And don't forget, like, we still have an identity as a woman. You still are the woman that wanted a career and a, yeah. a love marriage. So, you know, we have to just do whatever we can. Like, and how do you how do you raise shams now? Do you speak you know, Farsi? Do you speak English? What about traditions? Because it's an interracial relationship now and grandparents, like, how does that work? I speak Farsi with him when we're alone. Um, my mom as well, obviously. A lot of my cousins are not doing that. So um, it's, it's like an uphill battle because we're a very whitewashed American Americanized bubble, but um, yeah. every tradition that every Persian tradition that I have, I'm like a child. I want to keep it around us. Like, like there's a lot more than just Persian New Year. You know, if you if you if right. you you know look at yeah, and like just the generosity and the food and the fruits and all of the things and the culture. Like, I'm really big on that. Um, and whenever I'm hanging out with like Persian friends, it's all Farsi. Like when I'm with Golnessa Reza, like lately we've been together and it's like all of a sudden I'm like, wow, you know, I don't like the aspect of living with just an American guy that I can only speak English with because when I call Shervin or Mike or anyone that is fully Iranian, I get the chills in the best way, you know, and I, 
I call my aunties and I'm always like, tell me again about like this story. Like talk to me about like pomegranates and, you know, the longest night of the year and like show me, like, I just love, I'll start crying if I think like my husband might not be able to make me cry, but my auntie talking to me about how she slices the carrots and turmeric and the, you know, way she makes, you know, carrots and rice or whatever, it just will, it, that brings me, you know, to my, to my knees with love and overwhelmment. So I'm going to do my damnedest to keep the half Persian baby that I have napping right now, who was by the way, crying about five seconds before we pressed record. (laughs) I love that. I love that, you know, you're working to preserve our culture and that's what we all have to do, you know, living in America. And I also want to know now, basically, this is, you know, it depends on the person, but a lot of women, you know, are bad, they say with money, but you bought your dream home in Calabasas. Like, did you save money? Did you save all that money you made on Shaw's? Is it the real estate money? Like money tips. Okay. 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 So I'm not that great with my money. Okay. Well, let, here's, okay. So the, the best, the best thing that I did was, am I good with money? I mean, you live in Calabasas. <laughs> Can I say, this is what I think. Okay. Um, my best advice about money and my, what I've lived by was I consider myself to be frugal and living beneath my means always. So in the very beginning of my adulthood, when I bought a condo, that was the best thing because I was paying, I was paying off a property gradually that was within my means. I didn't have to be stressed out about money and I never had to make, and I never had to be in debt. So I wasn't allowing like interest rates to fall on my head. I wasn't the type of person that was going to go and buy something and then feel like I was getting bogged down and enslaved by something that I couldn't afford. I was very much like buy it with cash, not green money, but you know, like if I'm going to buy, um, a car, it had to be in that conservative lower third of your debt to income ratio. So um, I never felt like I, let's say, for instance, if you have um, the H&M Zara version or the Chanel Prada version, whatever one I wanted, like I didn't feel like I needed to prove something to the Joneses in order to like feel self-worth with that kind of thing. Um, The same goes for like decorations, like the couch. I'm not going to those fancy places. I'm going to like CB2, like, you know what I mean? Like, so that's, that's, that's one of the things where like, I, I think that people should be yeah, you just said you get it. So like, I'm over explaining no, it. I think you I, just made wise choices and you, you said it, you lived beyond, didn't live beyond your means. And learn to like, one of the next launches that I'm going to have is about the affordable, no brand stuff. Um, I'll show you when we get up, when we jump off. But the point is there is pressure. Like when I hang out with Reza, for instance, he's wearing head to toe labels. Well, you're Persian. <laughs> Everyone's, you know, decked out. A Birkin is like Zara. Hermes is Zara. Exactly. Right. Exactly. So, like, then you'll take somebody like, you know, Mike, who has this, you know, G Wagon, but then he'll like recustomize it and he'll wrap it again. And he'll, speaking of Hermes, like, there are so many of my friends. There's like, I know that they look at me and go like, I can't believe she's wearing Zara or like, where's the, you know, the Chanel on that bag. And I'm like, no, this isn't a brand. You know, it's like, I don't believe in like, I'm the person that's like proud and not going to get sucked into that, even though I know I'm being judged by my circle. But also now getting work done because 
you look phenomenal. In my opinion, you look the best I think you've ever looked. Thank you. You're aging, you know, in reverse. Benjamin Button over here. Thank and you. Your skin, it's like tight. It's flawless. It's snatched. You don't have a wrinkle. Like, what are you doing? So, um, first of all, in the Botox department, I got Botox May of last year and then I just got Botox again. So it does definitely smooth you. And I strongly believe that some people overdo it. Um, I also got Morpheus. So for my skin, listen, I'm not skinny. Maybe if I was, you know, 50 pounds thinner, my face would have more sag and droop or whatever. But um, I look at my mom Where's the wood for me to knock on? Here, hold on. Um, I think it's I think it's like such a blessing to see someone that's you know 30 years older than you that just amazes me. Morpheus 8. Oh god, it's the best thing. It's a skin tightening thing that um it's like getting electrocuted by a staple gun and they go all the way back and all the way forth. Um you know, I haven't gotten any other than Morpheus, which is an incredible laser. It's not cheap, but it's worth it. Um, you know, like I got my nose done, like went back in 2008. So it was like, or 2005. So it wasn't like that was going to make me look younger. I mean, I don't know, maybe we just found some good light or I have some good genes, but like, you know, um, it is really like, I have to just say, when I started to see wrinkles in my neck, I really thought that like, that was distracting. Well, you take care, you know, you're keeping up with it, I guess, you know, Botox. It started to, you know, like when you walk to your car and you're like putting the key in your car or whatever, you're like grabbing the groceries and you can, you're like self-conscious about something. So you're going to check the reflection of your car window. Okay. <laughs> So once I started to see some aging in my face, I was always like, okay, how do you look? How do you look here? How do you look from this angle? How do you look from, how do you look in that reflection? So it was always like, okay, the best thing that I can do for myself is my sweat belts, which make a really big difference. Um, start to spend a little bit more time uh, researching these things. I never believed that lasers were a real thing. I don't know. Yeah. I think there's a lot of things that are out there that people shouldn't get, but I got really lucky with Morpheus 8 because it really does um like re like recirculates and regenerates collagen and skin tightening and it's so good. It's so good. Otherwise, I think the when the Morpheus 8 stops working, I will get a lower face neck lift. But I mean, we'll see how long it lasts. <laughs> you look amazing. I'm so happy you have everything. I feel like you got everything and you give so many people hope. And thank you for coming on and talking with me. And I had such a pleasure talking to you. I had so much fun. I can't wait to hear more about what's up with you because yeah, I know that after, this is a, after we wrap. Yeah, because yeah, I know that this is an interview, but I still have so many questions. Yeah, you've piqued my you've piqued my interest. So um when I have been talking to Tommy on Till the Dirt, I'm like, he's like, I want to do, he's saying how he wants to branch out and do guy stuff. So if you and I can keep this conversation going. For sure. And we're so close. Like I can come to LA. My sister and my brother live there, so I'm there all the time. Oh my god, that's amazing. Yeah. That's amazing. Where? Glendale and uh, Culver City. Okay, good. So close. Yeah. We're going to have a, a second conversation now, like off the record. Okay. Okay. So before you leave. Before I leave, I just want to say I love everything that we talked about. But in summation, I'm not conflicted. I'm just so passionate about the woman's grind with love, career, you know, our future motherhood, it is something I would never, I, I will never regret the way that everything happened. 
spend the twenties being a kid, get pursuing your education and getting, you know, street smarts and work experience and spend your thirties doing, you know, a continuation of establishing that. And just my only thing that I want to make sure I drove home was don't delay freezing your eggs. And then once you meet the right person, don't be afraid to be aggressive about, you know, your feelings, um, standing up for what you believe in, prioritizing things, not being distracted, not allowing like too much of the noise around you to really get in the way of what you want. So I feel lucky that I was able to just like have the self-confidence built in me from a young age where I was not, I wasn't really bogged down with like what my parents wanted for me or what my peer group thought. So I feel like I got the reason why women and please continue to DM me, you know, and like ask me to talk about these things that you, you know, like that we're all going through, but like when it comes to fertility and husbands and trust and all of these things, like I just want to say that I don't have regrets, but I would like to, if I could give my younger self advice, like don't waste time either, you know, like go do everything that you need to do, but don't fuck around. Don't pussyfoot around. And like, don't allow yourself to be like, so complacent. Like if there's something that you need to confront to like get the truth out of yourself or figure it out, like get it done. You know, because I think that that's what happens. Like when they say like youth is wasted on the young, it's because we need somebody to tell us something like we need someone to attach to, to tell us like, you're showing me the way, you know, and I just want to make sure that no one here is lying to you. You know, like we're not, we're not bullshitting you. We're not telling you to wait forever. We're not, we're, I want you not to waste your time. I want you to make smart, wise decisions that are, you know, backed by your, your prowess and your, you know, your strength and your head screwed on. Right. So, you know, let's definitely, let's keep the conversation going. Let's talk, let's have a part two someday soon. For sure. I love that. And I love your message. It was beautiful. And I agree, you know, time is of the essence sometimes. Yes. Time is of the essence. Thank you so much. It was so fun talking to you. Thank you so much, too. Thank you so much for sipping the chai with me this week. If you like the show, remember to rate, review, and subscribe. You can also find me on Instagram at Anish Ramakrishna. I would love to hear from you. Join me next week for more chai.